All right, good morning. Um, so this is gonna be a first lecture uh, for chapter six, which goes over acid-base chemistry. Um, acid-base chemistry is kind of the, the foundation of all reactions that we're going to study uh, in this class. And they all involve more or less the same type of electron movement that we will go over in this chapter. <clears throat> so before we begin, I just wanted to find a couple of terms. If you were in lecture um, last week, uh, when we started acid-base chemistry, you might remember going over this. Um, so just a, a couple of definitions. So acids and bases can be described from two different perspectives. Um, and we refer to them as the, the Bronsted and Lewis definitions of acid and bases. All right, so the Bronsted acid we define as a proton donor and the Bronsted base we define as a proton acceptor. So from the Bronsted definition, we're focusing on the proton, right? Uh, that is being transferred from one molecule to another, the acid being the molecule that's donating and the base being the molecule that's accepting. All right, before we get into the Lewis definitions, let's go over a couple other terms. Um, so when I say proton, a lot, of, a lot of you will probably identify acids as hydrogen acceptors or hydrogen donors. Um, there's a, a kind of a, um, you know, a couple differences between hydrogens and protons. So here I have three different hydrogens, right? One we call a hydride, one we call hydrogen, and then one we call a proton. And just the difference among these is the number of electrons held in, in the orbital of these atoms. So a hydride is going to have one proton, right? So one, one particle in the middle surrounded by two electrons and a formal negative charge. A hydrogen is, is really atomic hydrogen, so one proton and one electron. And then a proton, right, is really just a hydrogen without any electron. So it's really just a proton. Okay, and so when we talk about a proton being donated, we're thinking about uh, the hydrogen on an atom. Uh, but when it's donated, it leaves its electrons behind. So only the proton, only that particle in the middle of the atom is actually being transferred from one molecule to another. Right, Bronsted definitions of acids and bases was, was early on. Lewis definitions of acids and bases came uh, later in the early 1900s uh, by a, a chemist named G.N. Lewis. Um, and he defined acids and bases more broadly by, by thinking about what the electrons are doing. And this is really how we're going to think of, of um, acids and bases. So uh, Lewis defined an acid as an electron pair acceptor um, and he defined a base as an electron pair donor. And you're gonna see when we look at these acid-base reactions that they fit both definitions, all right? So Lewis, uh, the Lewis definition is expanded to molecules that don't just have protons, right, but can um, accept a pair of electrons. And we'll see some examples of that later on. All right, so let's see here. Here's a general scheme for an acid-base reaction, all right? And you can see I've labeled that the acid and the base, right? So the acid here I've just shown as XH. This is the proton that's going to be donated. And then base is going to be Y with a pair of electrons, a non-bonding pair of electrons, all right? And when this reaction occurs, you can see we end up with X with a pair of electrons, all right? And then Y is connected to the proton that was donated from X. Okay, if we go down a little farther, so I've, I've drawn out a specific example of an acid-base reaction, right, to show that we can fit this general scheme to the specific example. So in this specific example, I've drawn out propanoic acid, right, so it's a three carbon carboxylic acid, and then triethylamine. So it's an, a, a tertiary amine in this case, an amino group with three ethyl groups. Right? The propanoic acid is going to serve as the acid, right? and the triethylamine is going to serve as the base. All of these reactions uh, are under equilibrium, like all chemical reactions. In acid-base chemi chemistry, we typically uh, will illustrate the actual equilibrium arrow. Right? And then on the other side of the reaction, um, once this reaction occurs, you can see that we have our X, right? In this case, oxygen with an extra pair of electrons and that forms the pro propanoate. And then uh, the amine, the nitrogen of the amino group picks up the proton and forms triethylammonium, right? If you look here, what I have written in red, you can see on the X, 
and on the oxygen, there's a proton and that proton is being donated, right? And so that would fit the definition of a Bronsted acid, right? On the base, whether we have the Y with a pair of electrons representing some generic base or a specific base triethylamine with a pair of electrons on nitrogen, this is the electron pair that's being donated to form a new bond with a proton on the acid, right? So this fits the Lewis definition of a base. Right? If we look on the other side, so here, whenever we, we draw out an acid-base scheme, whatever two molecules are on the left-hand side, or on the reactant side, we call the acid and the base. Right? And then the products, whatever two molecules are on the product side, are still an acid and a base, but we just refer to them as the conjugate base and the conjugate acid. All right? The conjugate base is going to be the acid after it's been deprotonated. Right? So if this is a reverse reaction, Right, this would serve as the base going in the opposite direction, right? Or this would serve as the base going in the opposite direction. So the two molecules on, on the right are always going to be the conjugate acid base pair. All right. This has nothing to do with the equilibrium, right? It's always going to be the two molecules on the right that we refer, refer to as the conjugate acid and conjugate base, right? And the two molecules on the left that refer we refer to as the just plain acid and base. All right, so if we look on the, the, the conjugate side or the product side, all right, you can see that these electrons here on the oxygen and on the X, this was the old bond. Those were the electrons in the old bond to hydrogen, right? So these two electrons represented by this line or these two electrons represented by that line are now sitting on oxygen or on X, right? And then this new sigma bond that's formed between Y and H, right? between those two atoms. Those are the old non-bonding pair that were on Y, right? Or in this case, the old non-bonding pair that were on nitrogen. So we're using this non-bonding pair to form a bond to the proton, right? And now that non-bonding pair is just represented by a bond. Right, we could represent all of this mechanistically. And so this is uh, the acid-base mechanism that we would that we would draw going in one direction, okay? And so this is, you got some experience in mechanisms when you uh, drew resonance structures, um, and this is gonna introduce you to reaction mechanisms, right? Representing new bonds forming uh, and old bonds breaking between two or more molecules, All right? So when I draw this acid-base mechanism, first of all, mechanism arrows, right? These red arrows that I draw here, and the arrows that you draw in resonance structures, they're always going to depict the movement of electrons. And so they always have to begin at an electron pair. And that can be a bonding electron pair, as we see here. Um, and you'll see later on that we can also draw arrows from non-bonding, or, or sorry, that it can be a non-bonding electron pair, as we see here. Uh, we can also draw arrows from bonding electron pairs, as shown here. Right? So there's an oxygen and hydrogen. There are two electrons between that oxygen and the hydrogen. And you can see the arrow starts at that bonding electron pair. For sigma bond formation, if you need to form a sigma bond, as we do here, right, the arrow will end at the atom getting the new bond. So we're trying to make a new bond between the basic nitrogen and the proton on the acid. And so when we show that mechanistically, we'll start the arrow at the nitrogen lone pair. Right, and draw the arrow pointing to the atom that we're making a new bond to, in this case, the proton or hydrogen. Right, and that new bond is, is illustrated with this line between nitrogen and hydrogen. Um, for non-bonding electron pair formation, the arrow will end at the atom getting the new electron pair, right? So this arrow here is showing break the uh, OH bond breaking and those two electrons ending up on oxygen, right? And so you can see those two electrons, you know, one of those pairs that are that's illustrated on oxygen here. So when we show that arrow, we're going to show it going through the bond, right? Because we're using those two electrons in the bond. And then we're going to point that arrow to the oxygen because those two electrons are leaving hydrogen and staying with oxygen to form a new lone pair. All right, and then the one thing that you have to remember whenever you're drawing mechanisms is that you cannot break the electron capacity rules, right? So for the second row elements, you have to, you have to respect the octet rule. 
can't fit any more than eight electrons around those second row elements, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, right? And for hydrogen, you can't have more than two electrons, right? So hydrogen can only hold two, two electrons. So when we look at this proton transfer, right, this proton is being transferred because hydrogen has two electrons around it. So if we're putting two in to make a new bond, we have to kick the two existing electrons out. Right, so we don't break that rule of having more than two electrons around hydrogen. What I encourage you to do is go on to the problem sets and practice some of these acid-base mechanisms. They might all look the same. Um, and so when you do this, try to put the acid and the base in different order, right? Maybe have the base on the left-hand side and the acid on the right-hand side. Don't draw them so that you know the, the electrons of the base are close to the proton. Make sure you can you know, draw it so that the proton is anywhere uh, around the molecule, all right? When you draw these mechanism arrows, it only matters where you start the arrow and where you end the arrow. How that arrow goes, right? So I can draw an arrow that goes up here and down here, and then as long as it points to the hydrogen, that communicates the same amount of information, all right? So the, the root of the arrow doesn't matter. It only matters where the arrow starts and where the arrow ends, where the arrow starts and where the arrow ends. All right, so let's talk about how these molecules are interacting and specifically how the orbitals, the molecular orbitals uh, around the molecules are going to be interacting. All right, so this is a picture of how propanoic acid and triethylamine would interact and the orbitals involved in that in interaction in order to affect the proton transfer in order to get a proton from this oxygen onto this nitrogen. Okay, so some of the orbitals that are gonna be involved, so here we have the OH bond, right? And that OH bond has two electrons and those two electrons are in the sigma bonding orbital between oxygen and hydrogen, all right? Remember, whenever you have a, uh, two atoms overlapping to make a, uh, a bond, right? If you have two orbitals overlapping to make a bond, uh, those orbitals will also produce an antibond. So the number of atomic orbitals are, that are overlapped are the number of molecular orbitals that are formed. So one bonding orbital and then one antibonding orbital. We went over sigma antibonding orbitals a little bit when we talked about um, conformation, right? But again, this is the sigma antibonding orbital. It's going to be on the back side, 180 degree orientation from the sigma bond. Right, these two lobes, both of these represent the one sigma antibonding orbital or sigma star orbital. You can see I have shown that uh, the results from the outer phase interaction of orbitals, right? So one side is gonna be shaded, right? The other side is not gonna be shaded. And then the other thing that I've done here is I've drawn the orbital or the part of the orbital on hydrogen a little bit bigger than the part of the orbital on oxygen. And this is just to show that when electrons add, they're going to add to the more positive of those two atoms. And so we draw this part of the orbital a little bigger and this part of the orbital a little smaller to show that the coefficient is larger here, right? And that this atom wants electrons more than that atom, okay? On the triethylamine, we have our bonding orbital, and this is going to be the sp3 orbital that holds a pair of non-bonding electrons. Okay, when these two molecules interact, right, in order to get this proton away from this oxygen and onto this nitrogen, this nitrogen sp3 orbital has to donate its electrons or overlap it, its electrons with this antibonding orbital. And so when these molecules approach each other, they have to approach each other so that these orbitals are effectively overlapping, right? They have to approach each other head on. They can't come in from this angle, can't come in from this angle. They have to approach each other so that there's effective overlap between those two, um, between those two orbitals. Okay, and so the orbital orientation, whether it's an sp3, whether it's a sp2 orbital, etc., that's going to determine how the molecules have to approach each other in order to get that proton transfer to occur. All right. So when we think about the molecular orbitals, the acid of the reaction is always going to uh, use its antibonding orbitals, right? And then the base of the reaction will always use a filled orbital. In this case, it's a non-bonding orbital, right? But it could also be a bonding orbital. 
Okay, it's important to point out that acid-base reactions are equilibrium reactions, right? Like all chemical reactions are equilibrium reactions, but I would say acid-base reactions, it's more important to recognize uh, the reaction equilibria because most reactions that we do in the lab, organic reactions that we would do in the lab, they're designed to be product favorites, so we get the product that we want. Acid-base reactions are not always designed to be product favored, um, and so we have to, you know, we, we often will represent the fact that they are equilibrium reactions by drawing the equilibrium arrow. Okay, so here are two different acid-base reactions. Here I have hydrogen chloride and water, right? And this is going to be a product favored reaction. So the proton from hydrogen chloride is going to be transferred to the oxygen of water to produce hydronium and then a chloride anion, all right? Oxygen gets the proton using its lone pair, so it gets a positive formal charge and it loses a lone pair, which is now being uh, used to form a bond to hydrogen. And then chloride, whenever this proton is ripped away from chlorine, the electrons in the sigma bond go back to chlorine, and so chlorine now has four non-bonding pairs of electrons and a formal negative charge, All right? The reaction, if it's product favored, is always going to have an equilibrium of greater than one. Okay, here's a reaction um, that is reactant favored, right? And so even though it's reactant favored, we're still drawing these reactants on the left-hand side of the chemical equation, all right? And representing the equilibrium, equil equilibrium arrow to show that this reaction is reactant favored. So here we have the base, or sorry, here we have the acid, here we have the base, here we have the uh, conjugate base, and here we have the conjugate acid. Okay, in this reaction, the KEQ is going to be less than one, technically between zero and one. All right, it's important to note that the acid-base reaction equilibrium will always favor the weaker acid and weaker base. And this should really make sense logically, right? Because the stronger acid and stronger base are gonna be the more reactive pair. Um, and so we would understand because they are more reactive that they're going to react more often, more frequently uh, than the weaker acid-base pair, right? And so when we look at these two reactions, the hydronium chloride is going to be the weaker acid-base pair, right? And the hydrogen chloride and the water will be the stronger acid-base pair. Down here, the sodium amid and hydrogen cyanide are going to be the stronger acid-base pair, right? So the conjugate acid and conjugate base are the stronger pair here, right? And the ammonium, uh, ammonia and sodium cyanide will be the weaker pair. So it seems pretty important then to be able to determine acid base strength, right? The strength of an acid or the strength of a base. And we're going to right now just focus on the strength of an acid and we'll get into base strength later on. And so before we really get into uh, acid strength and base strength, I, I want to define a couple of more terms, right? And so most of you are familiar with pH. Um, some of you, uh, hopefully all of you, but probably some of you are familiar with the term pKa. And so I want to differentiate these two terms. In this class, we're going to focus on pKa and use pKa values. We're going to ignore, we're not going to really talk about pH, um, other than in, to just distinguish it from pKa here in this lecture. All right, so here is uh, just a, a generic acid-base reaction that involves water. So the acid I'm just representing with XH, right? The base again is water. That water has uh, non-bonding electrons on oxygen. Um, and so those electrons are gonna reach over, grab a proton, this bond will break, right? And the electrons will go to uh, X to make the conjugate base, right? And then since oxygen gained a proton, the hydronium is going to be the conjugate acid. A pH, right, which a lot of people uh, think about as the strength of an acid, is not really the strength of an acid. And the, the reason why you probably think of that is because all of the acids that you've encountered before are probably aqueous acids, right? And so pH is really a measure of the hydronium concentration in water, right? So when we do this reaction, assuming that water is going to be the solvent of this reaction, 
right? It's a measure of the amount of this or the concentration of this in that water solution, right? So the higher the concentration of the hydronium, right, the more acidic the solution and the lower the pH value of that solution, okay? The lower the hydronium concentration, so if we don't form a whole lot of this in the reaction, right, this, that solution will be less acidic and the pH value will be higher, right? We say less acidic, we can also say at the same time more basic, um, and that will uh, equate to a higher pH. Okay, pKa, um, in contrast, is not a measure of concentration, but it's a measure of the strength of an acid, right? Or how easily an acid can donate its proton to a base. Okay, protons that are easy to donate, molecules that want to give up their protons are going to be stronger acids, and they'll be associated with lower pKa's. Okay, protons that are difficult to donate, or molecules that are reluctant to donate that proton, are going to be weaker acids, and they'll be associated with a higher pKa. Right, this relationship is very important, right? Weaker acids are gonna be associated with higher pKa's, stronger acids will always be associated with lower pKa's, okay? Now, if we look at pH and pKa, you can see that both of these terms use this P in front of the H and in front of the Ka. All the P is is negative log base 10, right? That's, it's just a, a function attached to uh, hydronium concentration, H plus concentration, or Ka, right? So it's just a mathematical function, right? Ka is just the acid equilibrium, right? And so we can define it by looking at the products of the, of the acid-base reaction, right? The conjugate acid and base relative to the reactants, which is just the acid in the base, right? pKa, typically when, when we look at uh, pKa's, pKa values, they are referenced to water. So that means in, you know, when people calculate pKa values that are published, um, the base that they're using is typically going to be water but technically we could use any base that we want, all right? Now you can imagine if this is a strong acid that we're using, right? If the acid that we're using is strong, then the conjugate acid and conjugate base are going to be more abundant than the acid and the base, right? So that means, you know, if it's a strong acid, it wants to donate its proton and the reactants are gonna be favored, or sorry, the products are gonna be favored over the reactants and as such, the Ka will be greater than one, right? Product favored. Um, if the acid that we're using is weak, if it's not reactive, right? Then now the denominator is going to be the higher number, right? The acid in the base concentration will be higher than the conjugate acid, conjugate base concentration, right? So Ka will be less than one, it'll be reactant favored. Right? It's important to note that you cannot have a Ka of a negative value, right? It can either be greater than one or it can be between zero and one. Okay, so on, uh, on Moodle, under chapter six, the very first document um, that is posted is the pKa table. I don't have a copy of it uh, with me, so I can't show it on this video, but I uh, ask you to bring it up now if you can, and then I have a couple of pKa values written down. All right, so here are several pKa values, four, four different pKa values of acids on this pKa table. See if you can locate them. This is going to be in the first column. This will be in the second column. This will also be in the second column. And then this amino group will be in the third column. All right, whenever you read this pKa table, it's referenced to a specific proton on the groups that you see, right? So when we look at this molecule, this is going to be in the first column, relatively high up. Right? Note that this molecule is going to have six other hydrogens, right? three attached to each carbon or each methyl group around this, this ketone. But it's this proton here specifically that is the acidic proton of the molecule. Likewise, this diketone here, right? we are also going to have three hydrogens on each methyl group 
right? And then there are two hydrogens in the middle, and it's specifically this proton here that is the most acidic proton and has a pKa value of 9.2. All right, alcohols, again, you can see here we have five other protons, right? But it's specifically the proton on oxygen that has a pKa of 16. And the uh, amino group here, again, we have five other protons, right? But it's specifically the proton on nitrogen that has a pKa of 39. Right, so I've drawn the acids here. I've shown the pKa values as they're published on the pKa table. Right, and then I've drawn the conjugate bases. So once this proton is pulled, right, this is what the conjugate base would look like. So those sigma electrons that are in this OH bond after the proton is pulled stay with oxygen and become the new non-bonding pair. Right here, once this proton is pulled, those carbon-hydrogen sigma electrons stay with carbon and become a new lone pair on carbon. And then this uh, conjugate base adopts a formal negative charge. Right? The alcohol, once this OH bond is broken, the sigma electrons stay with oxygen and become a new non-bonding pair in oxygen. And then with three non-bonding pairs, oxygen gets a formal negative charge. Right? And then the same thing with the amine, the NH sigma electrons after the proton is pulled, stay with nitrogen, become a new non-bonding pair. And then nitrogen, because it has an extra valence, adopts a formal negative charge. Right? When we think about assessing the strength of an acid, what we're really doing is we're not looking at the acid, but we're looking at the conjugate base, looking at the structure of the conjugate base, and we're going to estimate, right, or try to figure out the stability of the electron pair that is left behind after the proton is donated. So a couple of, of um, trends that we would see, right, if a molecule is very willing to donate a proton, what that means is that the electrons that are left behind are going to be very low energy, and very comfortable, right? And so here, right, stronger acids are always going to lead to weaker bases, right? The, strength, the, uh, the stronger the acid, the weaker the base that forms after deprotonation. Okay, down here, right, protons that are hard to uh, donate, once they are donated, the electrons that are left behind are going to be high energy and very unstable. Right, and so when we deprotonate weaker acids, right, acids that are less willing to give up a proton, they're going to form more reactive, higher energy bases. And that should make sense, right? If a molecule is not willing to give up a proton, you would think that it's going to be more reactive when it does, right? Higher energy when it actually does give up that proton. All right, in the next lecture, what we'll do is we'll take a look at some of the specific factors uh, that govern the stability of a conjugate base. Um, none of them should be surprising, right? So we've gone over many factors already that are a, that uh, that help stabilize electron pairs. Um, and at, in the next lecture, we're ju just going to lay them out one by one, right? So until then, think about some of the factors that would make some of these more stable and some of them less stable, right? You have the trend here and see what you can come up with.